Good morning to everybody. In, uh, I think it was 1957, there was a baseball player who was making a name for himself by being an absolute power hitter by the name of Hank Aaron. Most of us, if you're somewhat familiar with sports, with baseball, you've heard of Hank Aaron before. Uh, there was also a baseball player who was a catcher, played for the New York Yankees, named Yogi Berra. Uh, not the cartoon uh, bear that steals picnic baskets, uh, but the Hall of Fame catcher, Yogi Berra. Now, Berra was known for being a great baseball player, but just as much for his baseball skills, he was known as being a guy who would really get in your head when you stepped up to the plate, right? He's known for these famous quotes, these famous quips, and so uh, Berra was known for, he would crouch down, and as a batter would come up, he would say anything that he could say to get in the head, to get in the mind, to throw the batter off of his game. So they were playing the World Series, and the Milwaukee Braves were playing the New York Yankees, and Hank Aaron was playing for the Braves. Barra knows this guy is a threat. This guy is a hitter. He has been putting balls over the outfield wall all year long. And so he makes it a mission of his. He is going to get in the head, get in the mind of this young baseball player named Hank Aaron. And so Aaron comes up to the, to the plate, and he's holding his bat. And as he's walking up there, Yogi Berra is standing behind him, and he begins to say, Hank, you're doing it wrong. Hank, you're holding the bat wrong. You don't know what you're doing. You're holding the bat. It's all wrong. You're supposed to be able to hold the bat where you could read the, the logo that's going up and down the bat, the Louisville Slugger logo. He says, Hank, you're supposed to be able to read it. And Aaron's just trying to ignore him, and he's, he's squaring off, and Bear continues, you're holding it wrong. You're going to mess up. You're doing this all wrong. You're supposed to be able to read it. You're supposed to be able to read the bat. He ignores it. The pit comes. Hank Aaron swings and he hits a ball over the left, left field wall. Home run. He begins to go around the bases and he's circling the bases. And the umpire there will tell the story that as he is coming around and he comes across home plate, Barra is standing there and he's got his head down and he's just shaking his head. And Hank Aaron looks at Yogi Barra and he says, I didn't come here to read. I came here to hit. I didn't come here to read. I came here to hit, he said. I love that story. I love that intention of I know exactly what I came here to do. And nobody is going to throw me off of that. I know what I came here to do, and that's to hit balls over that outfield wall, and that's exactly what I'll do. I don't know about you, but sometimes I long to have that confidence and that determination to know exactly what it is that I'm supposed to do. I long for the church to know so clearly and to know so confidently what it is our mission is in this world. Like Hank Aaron to be able to say, I didn't come here too because we have an enemy who's constantly trying to fill our heads just like Yogi Berra back there and saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Right, this, is, this is about you, right? You're supposed to be able to make as much money as you can possibly make. You're supposed to acquire as much things as possible. You're supposed to make yourself as powerful and as known as possible. And he'll do it with the church too. He'll say, no, 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 you're supposed to create these programs and this program. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that. And he'll fill our heads with so many things that sometimes we can get distracted. And sometimes we can leave or wind up with this feeling of, I don't really know exactly what it is that I'm on this earth to do, personally, as an individual. We as a church sometimes can listen to all of these things from the enemy and say, what is it that we exist for? What is it exactly that we're here for? It's a question that philosophers have engaged for centuries, right? What is our purpose? What is it that we came here to do? This morning we're going to be in Luke chapter 6, and Jesus is going to gather together his followers. Jesus is going to gather together his disciples, and he's going to give them a very important message. And, and I think that what Jesus is doing is trying to instill in his followers, this is what you came here to do. This is what you guys are, are to be as a people. But if, if we read some of Jesus' words, I want to read a few things here to you um, at first. And then we're going to circle back and we're going to make a little sense of this. This is from Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 27. Uh, this is, in Luke, he calls it the Sermon on the Plain. It kind of mirrors what we see in Matthew, this Sermon on the Mount. Um, this is a, one of the first recorded sermons that we have of Jesus where he's got a collection of his faithful followers and Jesus is going to relay something to them. This is how you are to live. 
Now, this is vital stuff for us as Christians to be able to read these things and, and get this instruction from Christ, but it's also really, really difficult and challenging teachings that we hear. So just listen to the words that Jesus says. Verse 27, chapter 6. But you who are listening, to you who are, who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is some tough stuff, isn't it? Jesus says, love your enemies. When someone takes something from you, when someone demands something from you, then give them more. He says, if someone curses you, then you pray for them. If someone harms you, if someone offends you, they slap you, then turn to them the other cheek. This is all really difficult stuff, right? And so as Jesus has assembled this collection of followers and he gives them this teaching, you think, Jesus, you're going to run these guys off. This is hard stuff. But I think if we could create a lens for what it is that Jesus has assembled these people for, what is their mission? If they could have something to say, this is exactly what I am here for. Like Hank Aaron, I'm here to hit home runs and that's what I'm going to do. If we could create this lens to understand what is God doing in the world and what is Jesus' participation in that, I think we could make a little bit more sense of why Jesus is giving us such difficult teachings. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to reverse a little bit from this, this teaching, this sermon of Jesus, and try and understand first, what is it that we are here to do? So to understand that, I think we need to understand what is it that God is doing in the world. Now, this is important stuff that we're fixing to walk through, and I've tried to make it as simple as possible, um, and it's not really a, a simple thing. This is some, some heavy stuff, but I think we can understand it um, to see a trend or a timeline of what God has been doing from the beginning of Scripture and what God has been doing from the beginning of time all the way to now. So we're going to walk through this, uh, and hopefully we'll get a little bit of a better understanding here. <clears throat> if you've got your Bibles, just put your finger or your marker there in chapter 6. And let's turn over to Genesis chapter 1, right there in the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1 in verse 26. I want to read this to you. I want you to pay close attention to, to some of the words, pay close attention to some of the themes that you see here, and I think we'll begin to get an understanding of what God's purpose, what God's mission for the world is. Starting in verse 26. So at this point in the text, God has, has created all of creation, a created world. So God has created a space. God has created the sky. God has created land. He's separated it from water. God has created space, and then God has filled space, okay? So God creates the sky, and then God puts the birds in the sky. God creates all of these things, and then God fills. So God is a creator, and then God fills his creation. And he steps back, and he looks at his creation, and then God is going to say something here in verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all of the wild animals, and over all creatures that move along the ground. Now, this is interesting to me, but what we see here, who, who is God talking to? As God is in his place in, in the heavens, God says, let us make mankind in our image. It's so the very first, right there in the very first chapter of Scripture, we see this interplay of the Trinity as God seems to be in, in heaven with Jesus, with the Son, and with the Spirit. And as they're looking over this created goodness that, they, that they've made, they say, now let us make something in our image. Something that's going to be created to rule. Something that will be made to subdue all of creation. Jump over to verse 26, or 27. So... God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That's important. In God's image, in the image of the holy divine one, it says he created male and female. Unlike anything else, all of the, the creation that God has made is good. It's incredible. He steps back, he looks at it, he says, it is so good. But there's something different about man created in God's image to look like him. Verse 28. This is where I think we see some of this mission of God for people, for mankind. God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. 
rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves in the ground. So you remember, God was a creator. God creates space, and then God fills this space with things. Now God has created something in his image, and the, the mission that he gives, as soon as man is created, they're, giving a, they're given a job, right? As soon as man is brought into this earth, as soon as God breathes life, breathes spirit, his breath into this image of him that he has created, he gives it a job. He says, now multiply in number, be fruitful, multiply in number, and do what? Fill the earth. God says, fill the earth. Here's what I see God doing in this first part of Genesis here. We all know what an icon is. Think of like your computer screen, your Windows or your Mac screen, whatever it is that you are. You've got these little icons, right, that says this is Safari or this is Google Chrome or this is a folder. And so it's just this little bitty picture that lets you know here is what is inside of this thing, right? So these icons, I could click on it, this little image, and it will go and it will open up just megabytes and terabytes of information, right? I think God is doing this. As God makes this created world, then God puts these icons of himself in the world. These little images that look like God, these, these many versions of God himself. He creates something in his image. He fills the space that he has created with this and then gives them a job. He says, now you, as my image bearers, are to do what? To multiply in number and to fill the earth. To fill the earth, to fill the creation that I have made. And so it seems that man has this created job right here from the very beginning of God's plan. God puts them on earth and he says, now your job is to spread my image throughout all of creation. God's initial plan seems to be for his created world, this world, this earth that you and I live in, to be absolutely consumed and covered up with his image, his image bearers. And so right here, Eden is going to be the hub. The garden is going to be the hub of what God is doing. And he creates his image, and he says, now spread and fill all of the creation with my goodness. What a heavy task. What a heavy job that God has given to man to fill creation with his image so that all of the created world will be pointing to the glory of God. Fill the world with my image. Fill the world with worshipers of me. What a beautiful place, right? To imagine this whole earth, this whole world just being covered up in just one giant garden of Eden. One giant, all collection, every living, breathing creature existing to give glory and to worship God. That, that seems to be God's created intent. But you and I know the rest of the story because we've read through this. And what happens? Adam and Eve have this job. Adam and Eve have this mission to be image bearers of God, created in the image of God, to spread and to fill the image of God throughout the whole creation. And what do they do? There's an enemy. We talked about him two weeks ago. Satan steps into the picture, and Satan cannot stand the idea of the whole creation being filled with the image of God. And so he begins to do everything he can to counteract that. And so he begins to whisper his lies into the ears of Eve and into Adam. And they begin to make this decision to, to write their own story. While their created purpose was to make sure that the world knew of the greatness of God, they make a decision that we would like to be great. Like God, we would like to be great. Now they're starting to image who? Not God. Now they're starting to reflect the image of the fallen one, of Satan as that seems to be his sin, that he wanted to be great like God. And so these creations, these icons, these image bearers of God are now, from the very beginning of time, starting to reflect something much different than their creator. And so Adam and Eve have been given this job to create and to fill the created world with God's image, with his glory, and they fail to do so. They fail to do so. And what we'll see is there's a trend, and you can read all through Genesis, and it's some pretty upsetting stuff, right? And it'll go all the way up there to Noah and then it'll kind of continue that what happens where God was intending for the world to increase and to fill with his image and his glory, what happens is that the world begins to fill with darkness. The world begins to fill up with evil. And the world is, creation is overrun with something that looks far different from God. And so God is going to step in and he washes the world uh, there and removes all this evil with Noah and then it just continues. And man continues to fail in their mission of spreading and filling the earth with the glory of God. 
And we'll see in Genesis chapter 11, it goes all the way to the Tower of Babel. And there, the Tower of Babel, we see uh, as human beings, mankind is creating something, and they have this desire. Do you remember what their desire is at the story of Babel? They say, let us build a tower so that our names will be great. Let us make a name for ourselves. Man has forgotten what they've came here to do. Not make a name for ourselves, but to make the name of God known and great. Not to fill the earth with our greatness, but to fill the earth with his greatness and his goodness. And so there in Genesis 11, we see man uh, at sort of at its peak of wandering away and moving away from God's created intent. And so then we see a, a, a new phase here. In Genesis 12, God is going to do something different. While God's original intention, God's original plan begins with Adam and Eve, there to fill the earth with his image, um, that's gone wrong. And it's, it's not went the way uh, that God had intended for it to go, but God has a master plan. God is moving in this direction towards what we'll read in Revelation. And I know we've talked about this before, a new creation where the world looks as it should. God is constantly trending in this direction. And so in Genesis 12, after this story of Babel, we see God separating and calling out a new people and giving them a purpose just like Adam and Eve have a purpose. This is in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. So the Lord is talking to Abram here. He calls him to go from his country, your people and your father's household, into the land that I will show you. Verse 2, he says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great. You see the difference there? One chapter over in Babel, we see mankind, they say, let us make our name great. Let us make a name for himself. And now God is shifting this, and he's reining them back in. And he says, no, 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 no. I will make your name great. I am doing something through you. This isn't about you. So he says, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples of earth, all peoples of earth will be blessed through you. It seems that as God is calling out here, God is calling out the nation of Israel. God is forming a new people here through Abram, and he says, I will make your name great. And through you, I will bless you, just like Adam and Eve. I will bless you, and then I will give you a job to fill the earth with my image, to fill the earth with my love, with my goodness. That every crea- every one, every man, woman on the face of this earth will know my goodness through you. That everyone will begin to reflect my goodness and my glory because they will see you, Israel. And so God calls out this nation of Israel. In, in Exodus 19, he gives them this Um, through Moses, uh, this is what he says. Then Moses went up to God, this is in verse three, and the Lord called him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possessions. Although while the earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. You will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You will be for Israel. uh, Man now has another opportunity to do what God has called them to do. He, He sets aside this nation. He calls them as a people, and then he gives them a job. Israel's purpose, the nation of Israel, was to be sort of a hub, sort of like Eden there where the goodness of God will begin to fill all of creation. And the nations were to come to Israel, and they were to know the goodness of God, they were to know the glory of God, and then they were to go back into their nations and and share this news of a God that they've learned about through the nation of Israel. God says, you, Moses, tell the people that they are to be a kingdom of priests, a kingdom of people who point to me. A kingdom of people who point all of the nations of the world to me so that one day all of creation will be filled with my beautiful image bearers. And like with Adam and Eve, we know the story. If we've read through scripture, if we've read through the the history of Israel, we know that like with Adam and Eve, Israel seems to fail at the purpose that God has given them. God has given them this purpose to be their image, to look like him, to love like him so that the rest of the world will know his goodness and his love. And what does Israel do? Israel decides, instead of bearing the image of God himself, 
we will choose to bear the image of the other nations. And they'll bow down and they'll worship the foreign gods. And they'll treat people harshly and with oppression in the way that the surrounding nations do. Instead of conforming to the image of God and fulfilling the purpose that God has given them, as a nation, as a people, Israel decides to conform to the world around them. Instead of reflecting the image of God Almighty, they're reflecting what they see around them. And so Israel seems to fail in, in, in their purpose. But, good news, God is continuing to trend towards this new creation where all will recognize and worship him in his glory. And sort of the third phase that we see here in Colossians 1.15, uh, it's going to talk about Christ being this ultimate image of God, this ultimate image bearer of God. Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 15, the Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all of creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among all the dead, so that everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, and through him reconcile himself to all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus becomes this ultimate image bearer of God. And he comes down to earth. And this perfect image of God, this perfect icon of who God is, he represents God, as we read here in Colossians, in every possible way. He is the perfect reflection of the goodness of God. And he comes down here to earth to be what man has failed to be for so very long. And Jesus has a mission. Jesus has a mission to continue along with God's created intent for the world. That all of creation will know his goodness and his glory. That all of creation will exist to be image bearers of God Almighty. So if that's the mission of Jesus, if Jesus' mission is fulfilling the mission that God has been at in the world since the very beginning of time, it gives us a good lens to see what Jesus is doing when he calls his followers together and says, this is is how you are to live. So let's flip back to Luke chapter 6, and let's make some sense of this now. As we see the mission of God to fill the world with his image bearers and his glory, let's take a look at what Jesus does. This is in Luke chapter 6. We'll start in verse 12. So leading up to this point, we see Jesus, and he's began to heal, he's began to teach, uh, he's began to uh, get into some conflict with the Pharisees. Uh, in the very beginning of this, Jesus, uh, this chapter, Jesus is going to have a little bit of uh, contact here with the Pharisees where he's doing some things on the Sabbath uh, that they don't like. Jesus is, uh, his, his guys are eating grain in the field, he, he uh, heals a man with a withered hand, all these things on the Sabbath. And Jesus has been making these bold moves and bold proclamations about himself and here, Jesus, up to this point, has proven that he has authority over sickness, that he has the authority to heal, that he has authority over sin, and now that he is also, uh, what we see at the very beginning of chapter 6, the Lord of the Sabbath. And so Jesus has amassed a large following of people up to this point, but he's also amassed a large following of sort of people who are against Jesus and are going to try and deter him from the things that he came here to do. So, we read last week, sort of the calling of some of these first disciples. And now Jesus is going to do something uh, with 12 guys. He's going to call them out and give them a new title, a new, a new role. Verse 12, one of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called the disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom also he designated apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So Jesus calls these 12 guys, 12 of his disciples, people who had been following Jesus, people who had been listening to Jesus' teaching, and Jesus goes up to a mountainside to pray, okay? And this seems to be an important move in Jesus' ministry because he goes up to a mountainside and he's going to pray all night there. This is important to Jesus. He knows that this next move of selecting these 12 is important, and so he spends time talking to the Father so that I think he can make sure to make the right moves because this is crucial in what Jesus is planning to do. 
in fulfilling the mission of God. And so he wakes up the next morning, and there's this group of disciples, there's this group of people who have been following Jesus, and he is going to select 12 of them. I think it's important to understand the difference between a disciple and an apostle. It helps me in understanding uh, the significance of these guys that Jesus is calling out. So we'll just talk about the basic definitions. For a disciple, sort of the basic, the root definition of a disciple is a learner. Somebody who is learning. Somebody who is sitting at the feet of somebody learning. Uh, This was really common in their day. We see John had disciples. Uh, Lots of different rabbis and teachers had disciples. People who were learners. They just wanted to know more. They were faithfully following the teacher. They were sitting at their feet. They were soaking up everything that Jesus has to put out there to to teach, to do. These disciples are soaking this up. These guys are important. These guys are going to play vital roles in the ministry of Jesus. He's going to send them out eventually, and they're going to do some incredible work. But Jesus is going to call out from this group of disciples, people who have been following him, 12 apostles. So what's the difference between a disciple and an apostle? Where a disciple simply means they are a learner, an apostle is one who is sent. One who is sent on a mission. An apostle, a better word for our language today, would be an ambassador. Somebody who has a purpose, they are going out and they are representing the teacher. They are representing the master. And so Jesus selects 12 guys from this pool of people, from this pool of disciples, faithful followers. Jesus selects 12 of them and he says, you will be my ambassadors. You will be the ones who I will send out. I'm going to do something with you guys. And so Jesus calls these 12, and they come up to the mountainside, apparently, with Jesus. He calls them out, singles them out. I want to focus sort of on some of the geography here of what what we read in this passage. Uh, And I think Jesus is going to change these 12 guys' perspective of people. So let me show you what I mean by this. What we read is that Jesus is up on the mountain, and then he calls these these 12 guys to himself, right? And he's going to name them apostles. I'm going to send you out. You are going to be my ambassadors. And then if we pick up there in verse 17, it says, then he went down with them, and there stands a crowd of people waiting to be healed, waiting to be taught to, all right? So there's a change in perspective that these apostles go through. Can I get one of you guys? Noah, can you help me? Come up here, buddy. All right. All right, Noah, I'm going to ask you a few questions. They're super simple. Come right here. So before, when you were sitting right there on the front row, and you were looking this way, who do you see? Me. Yeah, simple, right? So that's sort of where these disciples have been, or these apostles at this point have been, as they follow Jesus, as they sit at his feet, they are constantly looking at Jesus, right? That's that's the way that disciples do. They they sit and they look at the teacher. They listen as the teacher's talking. And so Jesus takes these 12 guys and he completely shifts their their perspective, their view. I want you to look out there. Now who are you looking at? Yeah, lots of people. How many people, if you had to guess? Around 400 to 500 people. Does it make your heart beat a little bit when you're looking out there at that many people? It does me. Okay. So, once, understand this, once Jesus has called these apostles, like I've called Noah from sitting up there on the front row, at that perspective, at that point of view, all he's doing is he's looking at the teacher. All he's doing is he's receiving from the teacher, right? Um, But when I call you up here, And here's what I see Jesus doing. As Jesus comes down the mountain with these apostles, now they stand behind him. They're followers of Jesus. And everything that Jesus sees, as he comes down to this mountain in verse 17, it says there's a crowd of people standing there waiting to be healed, waiting to be taught to, waiting to be ministered to, a sea of broken people. And what do these apostles now see? They see the faces of the broken world that Jesus came to minister to. Their perspective has totally shifted. And as Jesus comes down the mountain with these guys, these 12 ambassadors, they now see, we have work to do. Everything that you see, Jesus, this crowd of people who are broken and in need of healing, Jesus now has these men stand behind him as if to say, this is our work. This is our ministry. Thanks, buddy. You can take a seat. So Jesus shifts the the perspective of these guys. No longer are they sitting and learning. Now they have a job. Now they have a role. Now they have a function to partner with Jesus in the ministry that he is doing, to partner with Jesus in spreading the news about a kingdom where all of creation is going to be worshiping the glory of God. And so these men come, and they have to be daunted as they come down to the bottom of this mountain and see this sea of people and know, oh, things are different. No longer do I just get to sit and listen. Jesus is calling me to do. Jesus is calling me to act. 
Jesus is calling us to work with him in the good things that he is doing for this sea of people. And so their perspective has been changed. The last thing is this. I think there's some significance in the number of apostles that Jesus chooses, right? Numbers play an important role in Scripture. And this number 12 seems to illustrate something powerful that Jesus is doing. So if we were out at the playground and I were to, if you knew much about sports, and I said, all right, I need four guys uh, to partner with me. We're going to be a team. What are we going to play? There's five of us now. Basketball, you got it. I said, guys, I need 10 other guys, all right? We're fixing to play another team of 11 people. What are we going to play? Football or soccer, whatever. Uh, football or soccer. These numbers mean something, right? And if you, if you know anything about these sports, you know, okay, there's five guys. They're fixing to go play basketball. There's 11 people. They're fixing to go play soccer or football. Here's what I think the, the crowd had to have picked up on what Jesus is doing. As he selects 12 people and they come down from the mountain, and Jesus says, these are my apostles. These are people who I now will send out. A light bulb has to come off that what Jesus is doing is creating a new Israel. What Jesus is doing is creating, if you remember this timeline, a new people who are going to be images of God, a new people who are going to be a nation of priests and a holy people so that the goodness of God can be spread throughout all of creation. There's a mission going on here with Jesus. He selects 12 people and he says, this is representation. I am forming a new Israel. I am forming a new people with the purpose of being the image of God to all of creation. And so Jesus' apostles and even Jesus' followers, his disciples, they're playing a role in this too, right? They will all form a new people. Jesus says, I've come to start something new. I've come to, to pick up on the mission of God, and making sure that his goodness is known throughout all of creation. So Jesus' followers now become, so the church now becomes the image bearers of God, the icons of of God here in this world. And we have to know what we're here to do, right? We're here to spread that. We're here to fill, to fill the earth with the glory and the goodness of God. So now we know sort of the mission of God. We know the mission of Jesus. We know what Jesus is doing by amassing these people, these followers. Uh, for us, the church, we have this goal now to be image bearers of God. Now we move on to these difficult teachings of God. And hopefully... We can understand these difficult teachings a little bit better by knowing what God is doing. There's this crowd of people. Jesus is going to talk to his disciples, to his apostles, all of these people here. In verse 20, it says, looking at his disciples, he said this. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you. When they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because you're, because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how the ancestors treated the prophets. Some weird stuff kind of that Jesus is teaching right here, right? He looks at these apostles and he says, blessed are you when you are weeping. Blessed are you when you are poor. Blessed are you when you hunger for righteousness. Blessed are you when people hate you. He says, when people hate you, you leap for joy because that's how they treated the prophets. That's how they treated image bearers of God in the past. Jesus, this isn't a very good motivational speech, is it? Jesus says, blessed are you when you are poor, when you hunger, when people hate you, all of these things. Here's what I think Jesus is doing. I think Jesus is trying to get his followers to understand that if you are to be the image of God, you now exist in a new economy, and the things that the world values, they don't have much value in the, in the economy of God. They don't have much value in the kingdom of God. If you were to be the image of God, then when you are poor, blessed are you, because that stuff just doesn't matter. When you hunger, that's fine. When people hate you, that's fine too. People have hated and they've rallied against the cause of God for centuries up to this point. When you are the image bearer of God, Jesus is very upfront with his followers. Things are going to be tough, but understand, it's okay. It's a good thing. He'll continue on with sort of some of the opposites of these things. But I think the sort of the, the core thing of what Jesus is trying to illustrate from the very beginning is this. As image bearers of God, you will have to live differently. As image bearers of God, understand that the world has become something that does not look like God. The world has become something that does not image God. So as you strive to be the image of God, 
you will have to look different. You will have to operate different. So when you are, understand, it is a blessing. It is a blessing to bear the image of God. He continues on, and then he's going to give some really tough teachings here. We read this a second ago. To you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. This stuff is difficult, right? But now we can kind of see what Jesus is doing, I think. He's going to clarify this a little bit uh, in verse 32. He says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend from those who you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to other sinners expecting to be repaid in full. Here Jesus is talking a lot about this, right? You're different. You're called to be different. Those who bear the image of God are different. So live differently. Interact with people differently. Love differently. Give differently. He's going to say give recklessly. Give so generously. He says, but love your enemies and do good to them and lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful. Understand this. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Aha. That's what Jesus is doing. That's what Jesus is saying with these difficult teachings. Be like God. You, Christian, you, follower of mine, understand that you are to be the image of God in the same way that Adam was called to be the image of God, in the same way that Israel was to be called as the image of God. You are the living image of God. The world needs to know what he looks like, and they need you to show them. So love people endlessly. Give to people recklessly. Give to them in ways that doesn't even make sense. Why? Because you have been loved endlessly. Because you have been given graciously. Why, why can Jesus say, love your enemies? Love those who hate you. Love those who do evil to you. Why can Jesus say that? I think Jesus is calling us to be like God in this sense. Because you and I, in our sins outside of the ministry of the cross, you and I stand as enemies to God. Before Jesus, you and I stand as opposition to the mission of God. By grace, by the love of God, through that cross of Jesus Christ and through his resurrection, we now stand on a different side, don't we? We were loved while enemies of the cross. So God says, if you're going to image me, if the world is going to know about a God who loves them despite anything else, then they need you to love them despite anything else. If the world is going to know about a God who gives so graciously to people who do not deserve and who can never give back, then you need to image to the world a grace and a love and a forgiveness and a generosity that doesn't expect anything back. You see the way this works? The teachings of Jesus make sense when we understand what he is calling us as his followers to do. To be the image of God. We have a mission as a church, don't we? To continue doing what, what God is doing. To be the image of God. To fill his creation. To fill this city. To fill our neighborhood. To fill our school. The image of God. To fill these places with people who are proclaiming the glory of God. Here's what I'm convinced of. I'm convinced that the church will never accomplish the mission of God until it begins to look like God. That means we will never create enough programs as a church. That means I will never be able to give sermons good enough. That means we will never have a worship style or a worship service that's ever good enough until we begin to love like God. Until we begin to look like God. You know how to make an impact in your community, in your city? Be the image of God. Love in ways that are unexpected. Love in ways that are unwarranted. Give when you're never going to receive anything back. And the world takes notice and begin to see that there's something different. And they, and they begin to understand the truth of a God who loves them through God's people, representing his image 
as they love him. I think it's really interesting what Jesus is calling us to do. He's calling us to look like our dad. Look like your father. I was thinking about that all week and and this idea of looking like your father, being the image of your father. Um, And and I know and and, uh, I'm sensitive to the fact that for some of us, um, we grew up with fathers that we, we just wouldn't want to image. But I, I want you to understand that there is, a, there is a father worth living in the image of. But for, for myself, for my story, I, I, I grew up uh, with a father that I wanted to look like. And I was thinking about that this week, and I was thinking how desperately when I was a kid, I wanted to look like my dad. I wanted to act like my dad, right? It's a pretty natural thing. But for me, I was thinking, I was asking the question, why did I want to look like him so much? My, my dad, um, he, he's worked for uh, probably 30 years at a manufacturing plant. Uh, he works on machinery there and does a great job at the place where he works. But because of that, uh, because of his work, dad would come home with these busted up hands. His hands would just be cut up. Uh, we, we always joke that there's never a day in my dad's life for the past 30 years that he hasn't had some fingernail be black uh, where he just mashed it really hard on something. So dad would come home with these busted up, cracked, bleeding hands. And his pants were always dirty for some reason. I guess I remember that as a kid. Dad would come home and his pants were dirty and he worked late hours. And so I think, why did I want to look like him so much? Because it's not a very glorious thing, right? Then I started to think, as I got older, as I matured a little bit more, I started to think, I I wanted to look like my dad because he was my dad. And and now I look back and I think, man, I, I want busted up hands like my dad, I want to come home with dirty pants because what does that represent? It represents a man who is hard at work for his family. As we begin to draw closer to God, as we begin to draw closer to Christ, I think some of these things that he calls us to do that we think, I would never want to look like that. I would never want to have to treat my enemies that way. It sounds so hard. We begin to understand, oh yeah, that's not a bad thing after all. I would love to look like my father in that way. And so we have this invitation from Christ to be image bearers of our Father, to look like Him. Here's the last thing I want to leave you with is this. As we ask ourselves, how in the world could you and I, how could we look like God? Because he's, he's God, right? How could we ever adequately bear the image of God Himself? I was thinking about my own Father. How is it that I, I, I do some things now? I, I, I talk uh, in similar ways that my dad talks. I think our laughs are different. Um, I even probably have some physical characteristics of my dad. We do things in a similar way. The older that I get, the more I think I begin to look like my father. And here's two reasons why. Number one is this, because I have spent time with my dad. I put time in knowing this man. We've had more conversations than we could ever begin to quantify, right? We have been through things together. And so it's no wonder that I begin to start to act like him. It's no wonder I begin to start to talk like him because I have spent so much time with him. I think in the same way as we're trying to be image bearers of God Almighty, we must spend time in his presence. We must know God to look like God. The second thing is this. It's unavoidable. I will look like my dad because I possess his genetic makeup, right? I possess his genes, his DNA. There's just some ways that I just can't help but look like my dad because he had so much involved in making me, right? I I possess his characteristics genetically inside me. Understand this, church. Through the blood and the grace of Jesus Christ and through that resurrection, through the baptism that we undergo into that resurrection with Christ, he says this, I will now dwell inside you. You will be my dwelling. Every fiber of your being will be covered up in my spirit. As Christians, as this nation of holy priests and people that God has called us to be as his image bearers to the world, you and I have a significant advantage in looking like the creator because the spirit of the creator lives inside each and every one of us. As we lean into the father, as we lean into a spirit that dwells inside you and I, I believe we begin to look like our God. And as we look like our God, as we serve as faithful images and icons of our God, the world around us begins to see the glory of God. And soon, there's a day coming. This this timeline is going to keep going, right? The church has now picked up the banner. The church has now picked up the torch. 
Soon there will be a day. We read about it at the end of Scripture. There's a new creation. There's a new time where the new kingdom will be fully come. And this world will know the glory of God. Church, we have a role. We have a mission in that. This morning, we're going to stand up and we're going to sing. We sing united as a church who is together working to be the image of God. This morning, if there's anybody who would like to say, you know what, I want to lean closer into my Lord. And I want to receive that gift of that spirit that he talks about. We want to ask that you do so as we come forward and we stand and sing.